Friends Podcast. Hi, I'm Diane Hunt. I am an impressionist realist painter connecting with nature through my brush. I work in oil paint and watercolor and I live in the countryside of Maryland's eastern shore, not far from the Chesapeake Bay. You can find me online at dianehuntstudio.com and on Facebook and Instagram at Diane Hunt Studio. Hi, I'm Constance Brosson of Steve Brosson's Jewelry Designs. I live in Oklahoma on a prairie, and I make uh, handmade jewelry in silver, copper, and brass. I'm an artist that paints. I paint pastels and in oil sometimes. Hello, this is Clyde JKL. I'm the host of this podcast. I am a emerging representational artist. I do historic rend- renderings, seascapes, landscapes, volcanicals, birds, and whatnot. The tight illustrative hand and watercolor, pen and ink, and acrylic paints. And I live in Oklahoma City. And welcome to the Artist Friends Podcast. It's Monday, once again. This is September the 28th. My name is Clyde J. Kell, and you are listening to the Artist Friends Podcast, episode 64. Tonight, it's just me and Diane. Uh, Constance sent me an email. She's been under the weather a little bit, so Constance is not joining us tonight. So it's just me and Diane. Hello, Diane. Hi, Clyde. Hello, everyone. All right. Last week's uh, recommended videos, we've been the entire month. I think we're going to wrap this this month up since this is the last episode for September. We've been uh, uh, talking about various uh, art movements, and we've come to the ro- Romanticism movement. And uh, the, some of the recommended videos explained a little bit about what that was. And it came about uh, after, you know, the French Revolution and other revolutions across Europe had uh, had started spreading and of course uh this influenced the artists of the period making the art and uh diane why don't you take it and explain a little bit of what the ro- romantic art the romanticism art period what that was <laughs> well it, like you said it was the time period after the revolution or actually it's part the revolution was kind of in that um time frame so even in uh, France, the, the, um, you think about romantic kind of art, and a lot of what was depicted didn't seem to be all that romantic. <laughs> but, and because they were depicting, you know, battles that were going on and, um, you know, things like that. So that was kind of contradictory in a way. But in England, it was more um, landscapes that were idealistic and, um, sweeter and like a, a a romantic way of life and things were more um, gentle, I guess. So. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like every time when I think of the uh, romanticism, uh, I think of that painting. I don't remember the artist who did it, but a very famous painting of uh, Napoleon on a horse and the horses, you know, raised God's hoofs raised up in the air and that's kind of like you know showing him being real masterful and going into battle and and uh um i was watching and because having watched this this video and thinking about the romanticism period i also just came across because i love history so i watched another video um of the about napoleon you know and and uh the narrator mentioned that 
that particular scene that was being portrayed in reality did not happen that way. He was supposedly, they were going, going over the, uh, over the Alps in order to get into uh, Austria and, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it shows him being on a horse and it's raised up and, you know, real powerful, the horse wild eyed. In reality, he rode up the mountain in the Alps. He rode up on a back of a donkey. (laughs) (laughs) I'd say a horse probably wouldn't make up the mountains. (laughs) The donkey was safer. (laughs) But I don't think it would have had the same impact if he's on a donkey. No. Which really, when I when I heard that, I started thinking about you know how artists you know don't necessarily portray reality, but they you know artists are also kind of propagandists, yeah. You know? And certainly during the Romanist uh, art period, they were very much propaganda. It was you could call it propaganda art, you know, and it's because they it was you know during the, the revolution they were portraying. Uh, from both sides, the uh, in the case of uh, Goya, you know his famous painting of the uh, uh, the, the French uh, soldiers that are executing uh, some prisoners, and they have the one guy whose arms raised up, you know, very very famous, you know, painting comes from that same period, you know, and that's considered the Romanticism period, and like you said. Doesn't seem yeah, it's kind of contradictory. <laughs> you wouldn't think that would fit in that right. time frame. But. but I guess it's what they say at the uh, um, the the artists the paintings from that period uh, portrayed uh, they were kind of like social active and like I said they were kind of like you know propaganda you know type art they they uh, portrayed uh, what was uh, going on at the time with the you know the, with the revolution and like you said the battle scene. yeah i guess i guess that's what it was they were, were, were romanticizing what was happening because they were on the sides of the revolution and you know the throwing overthrowing the government <laughs> they were on that side that was so they were romanticizing it to make it seem even, better than it was i guess <laughs> yeah even even the, the music of the period uh mozart was mostly associated with the Rococo period, you know, but uh, Beethoven is associated with the Romanticism because Beethoven was enthralled uh, with Napoleon and he uh, supported the uh, French Revolution in the beginning. In fact, I was watching the same documentary about the uh, uh, Napoleon. Uh, Mozart's, uh, I think it was his ninth his ninth symphony, uh, which uh, he was was dedicated to uh, Napoleon, but then whenever Napoleon uh, made himself emperor of France, <laughs> it completely destroyed uh, Beethoven's opinion of him. And in fact, he went back and erased and scratched out all of the references to Napoleon in his original <laughs> copy. He was so upset because he, said he felt betrayed because he was enthralled with the idea of the common man rising up and and uh, throwing, you know, and toppling the uh, 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 the uh, uh, autocratic cratic and the autocracy regimes and the the kings and and that's what you know, appealed, uh, appealed to Beethoven. In fact, all of his music kind of reflects this very boisterous and, and uh, <laughs> when you listen to, you know, Beethoven's work, it, you know, get your blood, you know, uh, going, so, yeah, let's go get them, you know. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> but you're right. They, uh, they rom- rom- romanticized the uh, activities and uh, the battle scenes were, were all. And if, um, a, in fact, historians years later, it takes a historian to actually, if you looked at all that and, you, and when you look at that art, you do, you get that, it, it gets the blood rising. You, you, get, you, you get your, uh, you know, the impression that uh, 
uh, th- this is uh, this is what uh, uh, w- that was going on when in reality <laughs> completely different. Once again, artists, you know, are uh, uh, portraying something that is not not real in a sense. What's your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, even the scenes and stuff, the way they set them up, they set them up to make the painting more dynamic and more um, uh, bit more visually interesting. Like, because the scenes weren't necessarily like that. Like they were saying that the guy, when they were doing the execution of that guy, they wouldn't have been like three feet from him, which is kind of how they were in the painting. <laughs> I mean, that would have been way too close. <clears throat> But he did that's just because it wouldn't all they, he'd have to have a much larger painting to have them the proper distance apart and you know so they had they had to move things around a little bit to make it more appealing and and more um fit into the frame but and that, that's like i don't remember the artist, <laughs> artist's name but there was a uh they talked about a painting that was uh done of a uh of a of a ship that was uh, a a prisoner ship, and it had <coughs> uh, had wrecked, and the, uh, uh, the crew of the sh- of the ship uh, they went and and put the, all of the uh, people, their their prisoners and and their captives or whatever they put them on a raft and set them out while they the crew and the and the the owners of the ship, they they Captain, yeah. they took the le- the lifeboats and yeah you know, and were rescued and the people on the raft floated around for days and eventually they you know they resorted it was, it was a couple of weeks or a couple wasn't a couple of weeks i think they floated around something like that <clears throat> that, that was um turner he painted that yeah Tur- yeah that was it and it was the there was resorted to uh, cannibal, cannibalism and but he didn't he obviously yeah you know, he 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 indicated some you know some dead bodies in the painting but they weren't the grotesque and it, it was, yeah they weren't emaciated they were um, they looked more like um, superheroes or something they had, they were all muscular and you know. Yeah, and it was, they weren't exactly like a dead body would be. Like, <laughs> and it was a case of you know, very romanticized. He made it a hero, you know, because he had he portrayed the image of the rescue ship, you know, coming and get him, and it's very, uh, very active and heroic, you know, like. But you know, in in, in reality, <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't like that at all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which. I think this brings us full circle because, you know, we, we talked about the uh, Hudson Bay uh, artists, Hudson Bay River artists, and many of their art, one of the reasons that that, that movement started was it was kind of like anti-romanticism. It was, they didn't want to, because those artists came from Europe. They were all trained in Europe. Most of them were. And they came and settled in the United States and they picked up the, you know, they liked doing the, the landscapes and, and the, uh, yeah. you know, they were enthralled with the, the wild nature, you know, the uh, American wilderness and, and uh, the uh, land, but they didn't want, want to do their paintings in a, in the same um, uh, category. They, they wanted to portray, to portray nature a little more realistic and toned down and and they were but they were influenced by the romanticist period well in the romanticism period they they thought of people as being conquerors of nature whereas in the hudson bay time it was more the other way it was more that nature was (laughs) you know um more important or or uh, it was something to be revered it wasn't like something that we conquered which you know is reflected uh, you know uh, uh, moran's uh, paintings and uh, beerstadt some of the name just a few of that period they grandiose 
and there there's people that are represented but they're real small as compared to these giant trees and the mountains and yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. where if it in the case of the uh, romantic art artists of uh, the of england which they also you know like you said earlier they uh, they did landscapes there were hardly any fig figures at all you know they were just just the landscapes you know just the nature you know there was no there weren't very many uh uh artists that you know portrayed people in the uh, in, in in that you know out of england now there's one other artist one of the other videos i found out that i evidently uh uh messed up on the email out to the link didn't work <laughs> <laughs> so I'm the only one that saw this. It was a video, a short video, talking about uh, the poet, the English poet William Blake. And the reason why I recommended that was his poetry, you know, was considered to be part of the Romanticist uh, period. In fact, his poetry, a lot of his poetry, was very depressing, very dark. But what I didn't know at the time was, okay, he was a, uh, he, when he started out, he self-published, but he also did illustrations, illustrated his poems on, w around the, the perimeters of his, of the text of his poem. And he was uh, a very good illustrator, but he wasn't quite recognized for that until years after his death, you know, and uh, there are still historians are still discovering a lot of his work and I just I, I just found that to be fascinating that uh, in his illustrations were this video talked about how they progressively as his poems changed his illustrations also changed and he got to, they started they were just like basic line drawings in the beginning but then they became more detailed and more elaborate and they could actually stand on their own, you know, with even without the the poem. You could look at the illustration and and pick up what he was trying to say without even reading the uh, the text. And illustrative art during that period was not was not very respected. Um, no, I mean Constable was in that one video some um, towards the end of it. And they were comparing the difference between Turner and Constable. Constable was more, um, his, his paintings were very atmospheric, I want to say. They were not very detailed. They were more, um, you know, just a lot of atmosphere and um, the feelings of what was going on in the places and stuff. He depicted the one thing where they, oh, it was the same ship or not, um, where they had, where they were throwing the slaves over. <clears throat> it was a slave ship, and they were throwing the slaves over because they were in a storm. Yeah. Yeah, that's and true. they were they did that to collect to be able to collect the um, insurance money <laughs> on the cargo, and they knew they weren't going to make it, so they they were throwing, tossing them overboard. I'm like, wow, that's really got to be crazy times. I don't know, but uh, he depicted fact, that in one of his paintings. In fact, uh, I think they said that that was that particular painting uh, actually because uh, slavery was was first outlaw it was outlawed in in, uh, in england you know before uh the uh, you know american colonies of course you know we were you know colonies of england and uh, it was uh, the english had, had outlawed it on the uh, uh you know on the british isles but uh it was you know still going on in the in the americas which is kind of hypocritical in a sense because they were English <laughs> colonists. They were enjoying the benefits of the uh, trade of the labor of slaves, but they didn't want it in, in their own, in the English nation, which, you know, you know that's a whole different subject. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Constable's paintings uh, <clears throat> led to that, to that movement of, uh, of, of outlaw and slavery and in, in the, in the English, uh, English homeland, I guess you would call it. Yeah, you know? <laughs> but you're right. Const uh, Constable's uh, uh, paintings were very, uh, very uh, the clouds and the skies, very moving and and uh, you know, 
supernatural like in a sense yeah <laughs> yeah they were very abstract for that time period especially i mean because most uh, most other p painters were more you know realistic or if not hyper realistic or um more of the classical idea and his were very atmospheric and kind of things were like disappear into the fog or the mist or whatever they were not very um, you know, detailed as far as the realism part of it. So it was a lot different. Yep. That's, that's pretty cool. <clears throat> okay. Um, before we end, let's talk a little bit about a major event that Diane is going to be participating. So what's the good news, Diane? Tell us about <laughs> what's happening. I had a painting that um, was uh, – Joried into the show for the Oil Painters of America um, Eastern Regional Show that's coming up in November. So I'm in the middle of getting that ready to um, be sent down there to that show, and so that's pretty exciting. It's the first time I've gotten into one, so <laughs> what, what is, not in, not into a show, but into into that particular show. So for our listeners, uh, what is the uh, Oil Painters of America you know, organization, and how big of a deal is this? Yeah. Well, the Oil Painters of America is um, a national sh national organization, and um, to be a member of the Oil Painters, they jury you, um, which means they you have to send them um, pictures of your your paintings, and they um, have judges that go over what you've sent them to and they only accept people that are of a certain quality um it, their their whole thing is to advance the cause of traditional and representative representational fine art so they look at all the um the drawing and your color and your composition and your appreciation of light within your paintings and they judged your work on all that. So, so it's not. Um, so it's not like an organization where you do, you pay a membership fee and you get accepted. You no, you have to go through the jury process to be a member, and then they have shows. Um, they have a, a western regional and an eastern regional, and then they have a national show. Um, I think they're the only ones they have in a year but they might have some other uh, i think they have some salon kind of shows and some other smaller shows but those are the main three ones the three main ones um so yeah I'm, i was really excited i found out saturday i got into it so so how many how many times have you uh submitted work in in these in these shows uh, i think to that organization i've probably submitted eight times maybe eight nine ten i don't know i i mean i have a record of it somewhere but um i think it's somewhere around that so what you're saying is each year so you don't for eight years each one <laughs> submitting yeah and you have to pay a, a fee each time to submit you know and it's not um i mean that you have to when you're submitting to all these different shows you have to really look at you know, what you're paying for and um, you have to, I mean, like I'm not wealthy, so I have to, you know, I have to figure out which ones are worth the money and which ones are, you know, worth my time and investment to, to go into because I can't afford to do in every show. I mean, there's so many shows, but um, so you kind of have to pick and choose which ones you apply for and which ones, you know, will um, benefit you as far as your career goes. I mean, if you're looking at it from a career point of view. <clears throat> so, I, so for our listeners, our non-artist listeners, uh, I guess the best analogy is like uh, having uh, like movies, films, that are uh, being, uh, uh, you know, nominated for the Oscar, for the Academy Awards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's similar. <laughs> and even if you don't win the Academy Award, the fact that you were nominated is a big 
thing on your career resume. This is basically of the same category for, for representational artists. Am I correct in saying that? Or? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know if it's with the Academy of <laughs> you know, the Oscars, but I mean, it is the national show for, the, for America. So there are, you know, thousands of people in the organization and the show, it, it, I think they picked a little over 100 paintings for the show. So I don't, I, mean, I don't know how many submissions they got, but I'm assuming they got a lot. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's kind of exciting yeah. to, to have been picked. So this is a, this is, so folks uh, this is a uh, a a major stepping stone for you know for Diane uh, and that's why I wanted to you know let her you know talk about it because Diane's a, you know she's a little you know kind of kind of shy a little and I <laughs> if, if she don't toot her own horn I'm going to toot it for her because <laughs> she's a artist you know I mean and then you know if the fact that she's been accepted okay that's 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 a line on the resume. That's a definite, you know, and she's tried eight times. So, Hey, yeah. uh, and if, yeah, I mean, these shows, you, you can't, um, let it bother you when you don't get in because like I said, there's thousands of entries and, you know, your chances aren't super high at getting in and they have different judges every time. So it's not like, you know, you know what the, that particular judge is looking for because you've you've entered stuff before to that same judge. It doesn't work that way. They always pick different judges, so you don't know, you know, what they're going to pick. But absolutely, you, you can't give up. <laughs> absolutely, and that's like I've been talking about. You know, I I enter the international shows shows, but they're they're uh, they're all uh, online, and they're of a lower category. They're not they're international and there's thousands of entries and, and so, and the judge, judge that you know, I get accepted. Yes. It's a resume booster, but it's not of the same level as to what Diane has, has been accepted in. And I think as an artist, you have to determine, you know, like uh, how much I myself, I'm building my, I'm coming from not having a single artist resume at all three years ago as to where Diane has, has a resume, you know, an artist resume. So, so these are different levels of, of uh, career opportunities. And whenever Diane becomes rich and famous and we will play the, we will play the episode back to her, says, don't forget us. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, years ago, I, when I first started entering shows, I was entering ones that were, you know, local, like, you know, little sh shows that were just nearby, and they weren't really, um, you know, that um, notoriety or whatever you want to call it. They weren't, you know, no somebody from the other side of the country probably wouldn't have even known about it. So, I mean, that, and you start there, that's where you start, and you just kind of, you have to keep taking steps, you know, and working your way up and, and learning the process and learning how it all works. And, you know, I mean, I started with local, then I went to more, um, like, the bigger cities in, nearby me, and then more regional, and then, you know, now a national show. So it's like you work your way up from, you know, and you, you have to start where you're at, so... Absolutely. You have to take baby steps. It takes time. And, and that's, and that's part of the, you know, uh, building, you know, building your, you know, building your art career, giving, uh, your, uh, building your resume up. And I, re I remember, uh, you know, we both took that, you know, Paul Klein's course and he, uh, you know, talked about that. He, he kept would frequently use the term baby steps, you know, and, and then, he, you know, talked about the emphasis of building, uh, writing an artist statement and building the biography. And he said, most of the time you're out, your, your art, uh, gallery, your gallerists and your art careers, they don't pay attention that much to the, uh, uh, artist statement. They don't, you know, even though they require it, they don't pay that much attention. Well, all these shows, entering all the shows, that's what they all, they, you have to have one ready. You have to, so, you know, I took time to, you know, write and develop the, you know, the artist statement so that when I started entering these shows, uh, I would, uh, I have it ready, you know, and uh, 
Well, I think part of what writing your artist statement does is it helps you to clarify in your own mind what your focus is and where which where you're heading. Like, you know, it, it's kind of a direction finder. It's like what is important to you and, you know, which, which direction do you want to go and which, how do you want to travel? Like, do you want to take all the back roads or do you want to go, you know, main highway or, you know, I mean, there's so many different variations on what you can do. But I think writing your statement helps you decide on a lot of that. Yep. A absolutely. Clarifies. So, so we're going to hear more uh, uh, information about this show. And when Diane receives uh, more information, the uh, exact dates and uh, location and address, and if there's going to be a uh, online version, she doesn't have all the information yet. Hopefully by the time our next podcast, uh, next week. Well, I know when it's going to be and when and the gallery it's going to be in, but I don't know if it's going to be, if they're going to have an online version or not. But it's going to be in November, November 20th to December 19th at the Rhine Art Gal Fine Art Gallery in um, Charleston, South Carolina. So. Cool. And we have listeners from all across the United States and all over the world. So uh, we Yeah, will, if anybody's in the area when the show's going on, <laughs> come visit. <laughs> come visit and, uh, see, you know, take some snap, some, some uh, snapshots and uh, send, the, send it to Diane or send it, send it to us so we can share them. That uh, this, is a, this is a major stepping stone. And uh, I, that's why when I found, when Diane had, had posted on Facebook that she was accepted, I was jumping up and down. I said, all right, one of our group is making it. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way I look at it. I feel like, you know, hey, because that's what we do. We support each other, you know, and uh, that, yeah. so uh, this is this is good. This, this needs to be applauded, you know, and uh, so let's wrap up this episode of uh, episode 64 for Monday, September the 28th, the Artist Friends Podcast. And it's just me and Diane here. Next week, hopefully, Constance will be back with us. And Constance, if you're listening to this, please take care of yourself. Get well. We need your voice in this conversation. And next week, you can add your opinions to about Diane getting in the show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say goodnight to Diane. Good night, Clyde. Good night, everyone. Thanks for listening, folks. Good night. The Artist Friends Podcast is produced and edited by Clyde J. Kale. Participating artists, Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson and Clyde J. Kale. You can find more information about Diane Hunt at www.dianehuntstudio.com. Constance Bronson at www.edsy.com forward slash shop forward slash C-B-R-O-S-N-A-N-S. -N -N Clyde J. Kale at www.cjkaleartworks.com. If you would like to participate or appear as a guest on the Artist Friends Podcast, please email cjkale at sign mystery-otr.com. If you enjoy these podcasts, please give us a thumbs up or a star rating. And most of all, send us your comments. This podcast is issued under the Creative Commons license.